So, let's get started. Um, so, I'm uh, super happy to welcome everybody back, or for the first time, to the first um, Haskellers meetup after uh, two years almost exactly, I think, since the last physical one. Yeah. Maybe even longer. Um, so, for um, everybody who's been here before, or who's part of the Zurich Friends of Haskell, welcome back. Nice to see you again. Um, for all of the first timers um, who maybe don't know about this meetup group, um, so the Haskellers meetup is monthly, or it's supposed to be monthly. It wasn't for two years now, but we're uh, changing that again, hopefully. Um, it's organized by the Zurich Friends of Haskell, um, of which I and some of the nice people in the audience were members. Um, so um, if you're interested in Haskell and you want to contribute to spreading the gospel and maybe organizing either these events or um, Zuri Hack, our big conference, if you know what that is, um, feel free to visit our website. Um, you can probably just put Zurich Friends of Haskell into Google and you'll find it. Um, and of course, if you would like to give a talk yourself because you did something really cool with Haskell, um, feel free to reach out as well. Um, so quick intro to myself. So my name is Kazim. Um, I am not a professional Haskeller, unfortunately, but um, I was a long-suffering Python developer before I managed to get a job um, doing statically hyperfunctional programming and uh, in Scala, which is not quite as good as Haskell, but it's, it's okay. Um, and this talk was basically um, born in my head uh, just as a reaction to doing that for a while and sort of observing the way um, the way I used to write code, the way I write code now, and the way some of the way um, some of the language features and uh, choices that you make when you're doing FP as we know it um, sort of work together. So um, two warnings about this talk. One of them is I'm not going to be showing too much code because this is more of a um, more of an abstract thing. Uh, maybe to ruminate on and sort of my reflections um, rather than uh, I did something really cool and I want to show you. Um, and the other one is that I also have to give a prior art warning. So um, if you know these two gentlemen, uh, so that's Simon Katie Jones on the left who invented Haskell and uh, Mike Kleinman on the right, um, who is a very prolific Haskeller. Um, these two gentlemen um, have given talks uh, before that I found during my research for this talk um, that go into very, very um, similar topics. Um, so if you're more interested in the historical aspects of how Haskell came about, um, I encourage you to check out, I think, Escaping the Ivory Tower by Mr. Mm -hmm. Katie Jones. And um, what makes Haskell unique by Mr. Snowman is sort of the more um, Let's say industry <laughs> applied version of the talk. But, um, you know, what do people think when they hear Haskell, right? It is like if you ask anybody randomly on the street and you say, okay, well, maybe not on the street because then you likely don't get any sensible answers. But if you ask any programmer, you know, what is Haskell? Um, Chances are, well, the most likely one is they might not have heard of it. Although it's more common now than it used to be that people actually know, okay, what is Haskell, or at least they've heard of it once. And if they've heard of it once, probably the most likely answer you're going to get is, well, Haskell is functional, right? That, that's sort of the big thing. It's like, if you think functional programming these days, probably people think Haskell. If they know a bit more about what Haskell is, well, they might say, eh, isn't it that thing where you put monads everywhere? Because it's also, Less so now, but that used to be the big thing, right? Oh, Haskell has monads, and they're scary, and people wrote all manner of blog posts about them, about how a monad is a burrito, is the famous one, right? So, um, and if they really know Haskell, but they just don't like it, they'll say that's the language for people who only want to write type signatures, but they don't want to write actual code. <clears throat> and so, 
to a certain extent, all of these like all of these things have like a lot of truth to them, right? So Haskell really is functional. That's like one of the biggest features it has. Um, Haskell is the thing with monads. It's a lazy, pure language. You can't do any I/O without using the I/O monad. And depending on what kind of code you're into, Haskell. If you're doing Haskell, you're probably doing a lot of um, fancy type level stuff. Um, but it's also true that none of these things really describes the language as a whole, right? You can't just point at it and say, oh well, Haskell is functional. Um, and there's a lot of arguments for why, so just saying a language is functional is like, doesn't really tell you too much, right? So one of them is you can't even really find functional. Um, I would say you probably can, right? I mean, what does <coughs> functional programming has always meant being able to compose functions, use them as first um, first class values. And so obviously Haskell is that, right? Like if you a function is a value like any other, you can pass it to other functions, you can put it inside of data structures, you can do pretty much whatever with it. Um, but it's also true that that's no longer exclusive to Haskell, right? So I mean, um, C is maybe the one language left where you can really say it's absolutely not functional. You can do such a thing as pass a pointer to a function, but it's not first class value. You can only do very certain things with it. Um, but in recent years, most mainstream languages uh, have just become, I think, properly functional. So JavaScript kind of always was, um, but even Java and C++, which are sort of the still big holdovers from um, the OOP craze, uh, they just have proper closures. So you can pretty much do um, all or almost all of the things um, that you expect from a functional language, like if we take a simple example, something like a Lisp or Erlang, you can also do in Java now. Um, and so, you know, that means, okay, clearly being functional is a necessary condition for Haskell being Haskell. But it's also pretty obvious that it's not a sufficient condition. You know, like, is being functional enough? And if you look at this code snippet, which I know is not very good Haskell, but it proves a point and it fits on the slide. Um, if you look at this kind of code, which is, I would think, pretty common style, um, a lot of functions you'll see in Haskell applications um, have a, have a certain abstract character to them, right? So in this particular case, you might see, um, this is something you might see in a lot of uh, applications that need to make some call to a web service. You're trying to perform some effect, you're trying to make a web request and maybe write to a database or something, um, and it might fail. So what do you do? You have, probably have some effect type. Um, in Haskell, you can encode these with type classes, right? You can say, um, I have some amount of catch, and I have some action I want to perform, and then I can write this function that just generically retries um, whatever that action is. And it's also clear that you could write this function in a language that doesn't have um, the same kind of expressive type system, but it's the question is whether you would. <laughs> so. the kind of um, typing discipline that, that Haskell has, I think, encourages people to write this um, more abstract logic um, that doesn't necessarily um, bind a function to a very concrete use case. And conversely, is being statically typed enough? Well, probably not, right? So um, there's a lot of language, most languages really, have static type systems. Even for the dynamically typed languages, some sort of graphical <coughs> typing is not very popular. So um, lots of people now use TypeScript uh, instead of plain JavaScript. Lots of people, when they write Python, especially in large applications, there's the MyPy um, gradual typing engine. Um, and then, of course, there's all of the other languages that from the beginning were just statically typed, right? Again, we can start with C. Um, but the difference is just, 
when we say I do statically type functional programming, we don't mean I'm using a Lisp and it happens to have a C-like type system, right? So the, the prototype for that, um, or historically the prototype for that really is standard ML with its hindley milner type system, parametric polymorphism, uh, type inference, and generally the ability to encode fairly complex constraints in your type system. Um, and of course in the Haskell case, something that's also super important to the way you write code is type classes, um, which makes it a pretty big, um, yeah, which is a pretty big feature that Haskell has um, that other languages don't. So why are type classes so important um, to the Haskell story? It's kind of because in a way there we are in Haskell um, the functional nature of the language and the, the statically typed nature of the language really kind of meet, right? Um, you want to be able to express all of these functions that perform sort of um, abstract things, right? So if you have almost every higher order function, it doesn't really tell you anything specific you want to do, right? It just describes a, a scheme for applying um, a function in the context of traversing a data structure or um, recursing a data structure or generally sort of performing some algorithm that you could plausibly do with any kind of concrete actions. And you also want to be able to express these things in a way that you can then type so that, you're, uh, that you can be sure your code is correct. And so one of the mechanisms Haskell uses for that is type classes. Um, and specifically, it has a lot of these more abstract type classes, right? So the, the, the famous one is, of course, the monad. Um, that's um, in Haskell, you obviously use to express I.O. actions, um, but also all manner of things, right? So if you have an, an option or an either or an I.O. monad or anything else, um, future type, you can use a lot of the same functions for each of them. Um, and sort of get this consistent um, composability. And this is kind of pretty rare elsewhere, right? So most languages um, don't have a proper type class mechanism, um, and the ones that do, uh, so for example, the other one that really kind of uh, went in for a type class like mechanism is, is Rust. <coughs> but Rust tends to have less abstract type classes, right? It tends to be more about um, things like serialization or uh, ways you can manipulate a certain value in memory. So it's less like Haskell where you obviously also have that kind of type class. Um, so everybody who's ever built a web facing thing in Haskell will have used JSON and derived serialization instances for that very liberally. But Haskell is of course also the language where you use type classes like applicative or monad. Um, traversable, foldable, to describe more algorithmic capabilities of um, data structures you might have. Um, and, and functions too, right? Um, and what's interesting in this context is sort of where the type classes actually came from. So, if you're um, familiar with standard ML, or OCaml2 I think has the same thing, um, or Erlang or Elixir, all of these languages have a sort of very built-in concept of equality, for example. So in standard ML, there was this thing called an ectype, which just said there are certain types that are primitive to the language that have a defined equality. And if you need to do anything where you're comparing these values, then you need to constrain it to an ectype. Um, and when Haskell was sort of being designed, um, one of the problems that came up was basically how to deal with this. You know, how do we make functions uh, that are polymorphic in their argument, but like don't run into Problems like we're trying to compare two values, but we can't make sure that they're comparable, or we're trying to multiply or add two values, but we don't know whether it's a number. Um, and the proposal that came out in the Haskell Language Committee 
or uh, what they called that at the time, but basically what happened was um, Philip Wadler um, came up with this idea of let's have a mechanism for describing the capabilities of some kind of, of some type. Let's say it's a number, so Haskell has the num type class where you say, okay, arithmetic operations are defined for everything that implements num um, or equality, right? You can compare everything that's an instance of ord, you can um, check for equality and everything that's an instance of ek. And originally, sort of type classes were meant to do that. Um, and <coughs> monads also have a similar story in terms of, you know, where did they come from? They came from the problem of trying to solve how do you do I.O. in a pure lazy language. So again, if you're interested in the history of this, Simon Peyton Jones has a much more um, in-depth history, but the gist was the original version of Haskell simply couldn't do I.O. You could pass a string to the function, to the program that represented the function, it would work on that string and do something and put out another string. That was the extent of it. Um, so eventually this situation was found to be unsatisfactory, so people were trying to come up with ways of how you could implement I.O. in a language that was pure, so you couldn't put abstract or arbitrary side effects just anywhere in your program. And also lazy, right? Because the laziness does another thing where you're never sure really what order your actions are evaluated in. So there was for a time this idea of doing basically stream-based I.O. where um, the program would just receive a stream of values and put out the stream of values, but that too basically didn't work because that meant you could only do I.O. at the beginning and end of your program. And so the same Mr. Wadler then read a paper by um, uh, an Italian computer scientist named Eugenio Moggi um, who basically described how you could encode um, sequential actions as a monad and that was then kind of picked up as the solution to the I.O. problem. Um, and originally that too was baked in, the only sort of really monadic type in Haskell was the I.O. monad, but together with the type class mechanism it was then possible to abstract this and just say, well, here we have these operations, right? We have join, we have uh, return, we have bind, that you can perform on anything that's a monad. And I is a monad, but then you can define instances also for list or either for option. And together with higher kind of type parameters, you could then have this mechanism to um, encode, um, encode the scheme in a very abstract way. And so this combination of features already is kind of not widely duplicated, right? So um, depending on what kind of libraries you use in Scala, um, uh, you can have this experience, but the only language that really sort of works, breeds this by design is Haskell. And in this context, what's also super important is laziness, because um, a lot of the shortcuts, quote unquote, taken by other languages basically weren't available to Haskell because the language was from day one supposed to be lazy. So standard ML and OCaml both just have arbitrary side effects anywhere. Um, and in those languages it works because they're strictly evaluated. So um, you get you get sort of the um, sequencing of everything you do uh, basically for free, but if you have a lazy language, then you don't, right? So that forces the language to pick some other mechanism to deal with I.O. and in the case of Haskell, um, that, was, that was monadic effects, basically. And <clears throat> laziness also lets you define Haskell programs very easily that deal with notionally infinite data, right? So, um, stream processing becomes pretty easy in Haskell, um, at least from a programmer's perspective, because you can just say, okay, well, this is basically an infinite list, and I'll deal with it like an infinite list, um, and you can leave the, depending on how <laughs> complicated the stuff is that you want to do, you can mostly leave the runtime to figure out how to actually deal with an infinite list of things. Um, and things like, you know, expressing certain kinds of, uh, numerical algorithms in co-monadic terms, right? 
um, are also enabled by task with laziness because you can just define a thing that is infinitely self-recursive and you don't have to worry about it just blowing up your stack. And then another feature, you know, that is not unique to Haskell, but it's also enabled by uh, all of the previous features is kind of the way that you can do concurrency and parallelism in Haskell. Because one of the features that Haskell apologists, if we can call them that way, uh, like to mention, you know, what's cool about Haskell is you have this really efficient read-thread implementation, right? Um, and there is also the way you can write asynchronous or concurrent or parallel code in Haskell is very easy compared to a lot of other languages. Um, so you have a cool runtime and you have a very nice user interface. And both of these are kind of enabled by the fact that you have this pure language where implementing such a runtime or making a nice user interface that doesn't present the programmer with too many flip guns um, is somewhat easier than in other languages because there's a bunch of failure conditions that you don't have to necessarily worry about quite as hard as you would in other languages. But so obviously, as I said before, right, it used to be a few years ago that all of this was basically confined to Haskell or languages in the same genealogical stream, right? So if you think back to 2012, um, not a lot of people were using higher order functions if they weren't explicitly describing themselves as functional programmers. Um, I mean, they were starting to get big in JavaScript, but still pretty rare elsewhere. Um, and definitely nobody <laughs> Nobody was talking about monads except if they were making Haskell blog posts. Um, but uh, things are starting to change, right? Where basically everything has higher order functions now. Um, uh, so obviously JavaScript, TypeScript, people use them everywhere. Python has had good Lambda support for a while. Um, Java has had them since Java 8 and C++. Um, not only has closures now, but it actually has a very, very um, I would say intricate closure syntax that even lets you specify exactly how you capture your environment, right? So this this thing that used to be our special sauce as functional programmers is kind of everywhere now. Um, type classes are also making appearances in other languages. Um, so obviously um, you get something fairly similar in object-oriented languages or languages with a subtyping system um, where you can just implement a class. Um, but with Rust, there's now a fairly mainstream language that just has type classes essentially in the same or a very similar way that Haskell has them. Um, and a lot of the more um, object-oriented languages are also starting to put more emphasis on the, on the concept of interfaces, right, rather than inheritance. Um, and in terms of sort of the, the, the uh, wacky type level programming, well, if you look at some TypeScript code bases, um, there's actually a lot going on in a lot of, um, you know, very non-academic code bases where you say, okay, well, this is the sort of stuff that you would have seen in papers like 20 years ago and now people are just doing it, right? So, um, this combination of features alone um, is no longer really that easy to have. Um, to backtrack for a bit though, you can answer the question, okay, well, you know, a lot of these languages have kind of some of what Haskell has, but nobody has all of the things, right, in the same way. Um, but the way some of the code, like, starts to resemble each other, you know, maybe if you just take the things that, the core Haskell principles, right? You, you have a language that's pure, that's lazy, that's functional, that has these um, this ability to abstract interfaces with type classes. Are you just going to get Haskell, right? So, um, if you look at a code like this, the thing on the on the left, uh, I lifted from a, a TypeScript code base that's 
for a virtual tabletop game. Um, and at first glance, it looks, no, it doesn't look like the thing on the right at all, right? But if you look at it more closely, I mean, what are you doing, right? So this, this function creates a list of promises, and famously, um, JavaScript promises have a monadic interface, um, to the point where um, if reports are to be believed, like the word is starting to get some currency in the front-end world. Um, and then there's this cool promise all function that turns a list of promises into a promise of list, or an array of promises into a promise of an array of values. And simplifying a little bit, um, I mean, just pretend that all of the stuff in the middle is encapsulated in this evaluate function. Um, if you express this thing in Haskell, well, it looks different, right? Because it's not the same syntax. But the way you're writing the code is basically the same. So you're, um, in JavaScript, you have map composed of sequence, but that's just traverse. So what you're really doing on the left is basically the same thing as you're doing on the right in Haskell. So just from having this kind of combination of a monadic effect type, right, which is not pervasive in, in TypeScript or JavaScript, but you do have this promise type um, that exposes a very similar interface to Haskell monads um, and high order functions, um, you kind of get code that is functionally the same, even if it looks a bit different. And to a certain extent, you might say, well, okay, there's a bit of buy one, get one free that goes on here, right? Um, because if you think about it, um, we've already covered how if you have a lazy language, you basically need some form of effect type um, if you want to have satisfactory I.O. Because um, if you're saying, well, we're lazy and we're pure, you need to have some way of encapsulating your side effects and you need to have some way of sequencing them. So you'll probably land at a fairly similar mechanism we covered what you do. But also, um, and this is an interesting story from Scala land, if you do have monadic I.O., then laziness, or at least call by name, uh, starts to get more attractive. So um, for those who are not familiar, Scala is basically what happens if Java tries to be Haskell. Um, it's um, a language that runs on the JVM, um, and it has native support for a lot of um, the things that enable that enable Haskell. So um, type classes via traits, um, high order functions, higher kind of data, and so on. And so there's a large library ecosystem that basically lets you write Scala as if it were Haskell. And just yesterday or today, um, one of the biggest effect libraries for Scala came up with a new major version. One of the things they did was that all of the um, parameters to functions that take an effect type are now called by value, uh, called by name, rather than called by value. And the reason why they did this is basically because that way you can prevent double evaluation in contexts like the snippet I had before, right? If you want to write a function that just retries an effect, if it fails, um, that gets a lot hairier if you're actually strictly evaluating the effect by mistake, right? So you can improve the, if you, if you already have this style of writing code, you can um, make it easier to use or you can remove some foot guns if you move it a bit closer to, to what has to have. Um, similarly, you know, if you look at that TypeScript example again, if you have something like this future type and you have higher order functions, then you, there's going to be a lot of incentive to let people write that code in a very similar way to how they do it in Haskell. Um, because if you don't expose these interfaces, something like basically the traverse, well, then you could get your futures type stuck somewhere in your list and it would be difficult to work with. Um, and indeed, that's actually what happened with JavaScript. So the, um, a bunch of APIs used to be uh, pretty crappy and then people kind of pushed the developer teams to add features that would make it easier to use. And now, presto, 
um, a lot of asynchronous stuff than JavaScript and TypeScript has this pretty Haskell-ish interface. And then to a third consideration, well, if you already have higher order functions and you also have parametric polymorphism, the type classes are just very appealing, right? Because the counter example of this is standard ML that kind of predates the idea of type classes. Um, and for reasons of people not wanting to change it, they never added them. Um, and it's very annoying because um, certain types of things are just bound to what the language lets you do. There's no way of adding a new type, for example, that you can compare for equality because X types are just limited by design. There's only certain kind of types that can be X types and if you're trying to do something else, then you're shit out of luck. Um, and so, you know, you see that also, I would say, in, in Rust because that basically went for um, having a type system like that and then the trace system um, I would say comes pretty naturally. So if we go back to the Haskell story, um, you know, you could you could be excused for thinking of it in this way, right? Like you start with this group of researchers who want to make a language that's purely functional and that's lazy. Um, you then run into some problems with the implementation of that language. So one of the things was basically, okay, how do we get our polymorphic functions to work, right? How do we get simple things like equality or ordering or numerical operations out of the way? Well, let's have this thing that we'll call a type class that will just basically encode what can I do with this value. Or, okay, well, now we have this language and it's pure and it's lazy. But it can't do I.O. So eventually it would be nice to also be able to write programs that can do I.O. right? That can perform a side effect. And you know, somebody comes up with this idea of monads uh, as a as a way of encoding sort of sequential effects and presto, you get you get the way you do I.O. in Haskell today. And because of these sort of early design choices. Um, you know, you get one time that's pretty small um, and that uh, enables a lot of powerful features in top. Um, so you, you know, it's pretty easy to look at it now and say, okay, well, surely it just kind of fell out that way, right? Because you can also say, you know, what what problems do these features solve? You know, um, you have functional programming. If you take as a baseline, you say, well, what does functional programming do? And there's a famous paper um, called "Why Functional Programming Is Important" uh, that was, I think, written in the '80s. Um, that basically says, well, functional programming enables modularity. So what does that mean? Well, if you have higher order functions, you can sort of decompose the things you do with your functions into smaller bits. You can write a function that operates on one value or maybe two values. It just does something to them. And then if you want to extend that function to say a list of elements or a tree of elements or an action, you know, a monadic action that produces an element of that type, then you can just use common names like map or fold um, or traverse. Um, and you can sort of decouple, in a sense, the algorithmics of what you're doing from your individual operations on, on data types. And conversely, having the expressive type system that Haskell does makes the modularity safe, right? Because you think of, um, if you've ever written a or participated in writing a code base that was pretty large in a language like Python, um, it gets pretty messy, or at least that was always my experience. If you have a different experience, please teach me the secret. <laughs> uh, but it gets pretty messy pretty quickly because 
there's nothing there to help here, right? Like the static type system, if you have one and it's good, it doesn't get in your way, uh, lets you catch a lot of stupid mistakes early. Um, and this becomes all the more important if you're sort of defining your functions in this piecemeal way, right? So um, I've not had the, the luxury of trying to work on like a big Lisp code base, um, but I can imagine that probably the Lisp people used to have this problem even more because Lisp is very functional, right? From the beginning, Lisp uh, dialects have always made a lot of use of Lambda abstractions, a lot of use of, of higher order functions, um, but they also tend to be untyped. So if you write like a big Lisp code base, um, or actually probably everybody who's ever contributed to an open source Emacs plugin uh, can attest that also gets pretty hairy. So essentially functional programming and expressive type systems kind of reinforce each other because one of the features enables modularity and the other one makes it, perhaps convenient is the wrong word, but makes it um, sufficiently safe for you to use where you don't need to suddenly start paying way more attention to your code just because you've made it more modular. Um, and I would argue that in the Haskell case, the fact that it's pure and lazy contributes to this uh, mutually reinforcing effect. Because what does purity do, right? Purity means you can perform arbitrary side effects in just whatever function. So, um, okay, well, if you ignore unsafe perform IO, um, you can basically be sure that any function that says it's pure from its signature is going to be pure. And any function that uh, says it's IO of something, um, you have to consider uh, that it might do something and you should probably look at what it actually does. And so that's a way in which um, purity, because of how it pushes this separation between pure and impure functions into the type system, um, uh, Enables, um, enables that safety even more. And laziness does a similar thing uh, for modularity, right? Because um, <clears throat> while it's annoying in some cases, in general, um, because you have, um, if you have laziness or if you have call by name, um, Reevaluations of things are not something you have to handle explicitly, um, and you don't need to um, write, for example, functions that are specifically designed to handle um, notionally infinite data. Right? You can just use your normal um, methods that you have for dealing with finite data, and you can extend them for dealing with infinite data. So um, it's a pretty unsurprising that the world is kind of becoming more functional, right? Um, especially if you're working off the hypothesis that these features are mutually reinforcing, which I think there's a strong case to be made for, um, and the problems these things actually solve, um, you know, there's a lot more of that going around. So it used to be that distributed systems was kind of like a specialty thing, uh, that only a few people did. Well, now basically most people are doing some kind of web programming. Um, so a lot of people have to deal with all of the failure modes that come with having a distributed system. Um, having something that, you know, you can't just control all of the, um, you don't control all of the bits maybe because you're relying on external APIs or you're relying on something, if you're working at a big company, somebody, something that somebody in another team wrote, that sort of thing. Um, and you also are getting larger and larger code bases, right? Because of how much software has been eating the world. And so for both of these reasons, um, modularity um, is basically just as much of a buzzword um, as it used to be back when the, when the concept was first invented, right? Because of the constraints, that have um, pushed people to write more modular code um, are not only still there, but they're getting stronger than ever. Um, 
Um, simultaneously, um, you know, the programming language people haven't been asleep. So um, there's been a lot of advances in compilers, a lot of advances in figuring out how to run certain things efficiently, um, and also, of course, faster hardware or hardware with more special capabilities that have made um, advanced language features basically economic for programmers to use, right? So it's a uh, the kind of things that compilers can translate today or that they can verify today is much larger set of things than were uh, easily possible in the 1970s. Um, and I would say that, you know, um, given the amount of languages that have added these features and the, the rate of uptake, um, you know, the quality of life improvements from writing code this way, are taking well, taking world by storm is maybe a bit optimistic, but it's definitely getting there. And so, um, the question that then remains is, okay, well, we've talked about all of these things that Haskell used to have basically for itself, that it no longer has for itself. Um, so what's not yet catching on, or what might never catch on? Um, you have the advanced higher primary types, right? So things like GADTs or type families or beta families um, that are pretty common if you're writing Haskell or Haskell style code. Um, so in the code base I work on, we use GADTs fairly extensively, for example. Um, but that's something most languages don't support. Um, and also something that, you know, uh, even, even when languages do support it, um, it doesn't necessarily see a lot of uptake. So, um, Scala, is, for example, lets you use JDTs fairly easily, but I've met several Scala developers um, who did mostly functional programming throughout their careers who basically never used JDTs. Um, Haskell style generics, for example, is another thing um, that basically doesn't exist anywhere else really, um, largely also because some types in Haskell are still, I would say, probably still more first class and more pervasive than in most of the languages. So um, the two other languages, the other languages I can think of that really have some types. Um, in the C++ case, they're a recent library feature, right? They're kind of an afterthought. Um, TypeScript has them, but TypeScript is also weird in that it doesn't um, it doesn't make them into discriminated unions by default, so you can't really pattern match in TypeScript. Um, Scala you do, but you you implement them by subclassing a trait. Um, so And Rust, Rust, for understandable reasons, doesn't really want to do the kind of thing that you do with Haskell generics because it's not that into um, um, reflection style features, essentially. So, um, in Rust, you would probably have to do that sort of thing with macros. And the third one, um, third kind of thing that you don't really see a lot is effect type classes. So. Um, it's still, most languages that have some sort of monadic interface for effects um, tend to have them only for certain things. So the classic one is most languages I can think of that have, uh, have an async library that is pretty monadic. Um, well, maybe not most languages, but the ones I'm familiar with have that kind of thing. Um, and the interfaces they expose are pretty similar to what you would get from Haskell, but it's just everything is monomorphic and it's specialized to the async use case. Um, um, or you can even get things like um, Elm, right? That's basically browser Haskell, um, but that by design doesn't have type classes. Or you can get things like Rust, where you do have type classes via the trait mechanism, um, but because it's designed to be a language that's basically closer to the hardware, um, you don't really get like this, this abstraction of um, composing functions that you do in 
in Haskell by a type classes like uh, functor or applicative or, or what not. So then the question is, okay, um, we've talked about how, how Haskell has got to be this way, right? And what, what, what still makes it unique? Um, and what's starting to be less unique? Um, so, you know, the question is what might the future hold, right? Where, what, what are going to be the things that still make Haskell unique? Um, or the answers for, you know, what makes Haskell Haskell in the future? Um, and my guess is that in terms of very advanced type features, Haskell will probably remain the premier laboratory for everything. Um, I still don't know any other language um, where people do that sort of thing. And even if it eventually gets overtaken as a research language, um, I would say that in terms of um, implementations of sort of the statically typed functional programming paradigm, um, it's still kind of the canonical one, right? Like all of the features that you tend to say that, you know, probably we all like about uh, languages like Haskell, things like pattern matching, things like higher order functions, things like type class abstraction, um, even if other languages have them, um, usually for reasons of legacy compatibility, they tend to be just not quite as good as Haskell. Um, or in the case of languages like Rust, there are also different similar because the languages were intended for very different use cases. So, um, in conclusion, I would say basically that um, even though all of the individual things that make Haskell Haskell um, might no longer be unique to it, um, the combination is still pretty unique and um, it will probably the combination is still pretty unique and it will probably remain the best Haskell will remain the best Haskell that there ever was. Okay. That was it. So um, this was basically a long ramble uh, by me. So uh, you're all very invited to have questions or opinions on the talk. Um, side effects of functions, it means that you can't, or you could only with great difficulty guarantee um, that these side effects are executed in a certain order. And that makes, it, that makes it very difficult, right, because you want to do things even as simple as read from a file, do something to the text, and write it back out, um, depending on what situation you're trying to do that in, it becomes hard to, um, to guarantee you're actually doing it that way. And if you then basically say, okay, we're going to keep the language pure and encode these actions in a way that lets us sequence them algebraically, um, then you solve that problem, right? So um, that's basically also the reason why it took Haskell so long to grow an audio system, um, because it was, it was very difficult basically for them to come up with a way of doing it um, in a way that was compatible with, uh, with laziness, basically. So it's basically that in the 
it, it would feel unparalleled conversation so ever uh, with things in the land of order or something like that. Exactly, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's not that it's necessarily the case, but it's just um, if, you, if you have no way of essentially telling the compiler, okay, this is a side effect, and you don't know which effect depends on what, um, then the safe approach would basically have to be, okay, just do everything in linear order. And then the benefits of laziness like become essentially you stop having laziness, right? Because you need to you need to be strict, um, except in, in, in very certain cases where you might be able to infer, okay, this doesn't do like we've inferred this is pure, so we can reorder it. Thank you. mentioned um, the lack of something like functor, applicative monad, and so on in Rust. If I remember right, one of the uh, lacking features there is being able to define trade instances on higher kind of types or something like this, right? Um, but as far as I know, there, there was uh, a feature that had been discussed as an alternative approach about... Um, forget the details, but I think in, in trades, if you sort of have... <coughs> Um, a parameters, parameterized type in the trait or something like this, uh, you, you could still work it out. Um, in, in the research for this, did you look into what, what this is looking like at the moment, like where Rust is going there? Um, only briefly, I think the last I saw of it, um, this was still stuck somewhere in RFC um, status, and part of the reason for that is that um, a lot of the use cases that Pascal solves by these kind of type classes, Rust kind of does by iterators, right? So a lot of stuff you can more or less duplicate by just finding the appropriate iterators. Um, and there's also, I mean, you know, maybe Alex I can say more because he's probably more in tune with it, but uh, for what I've seen, there's also a bit of pushback basically against the Haskell brain who wants all of these type classes where it's like, well, we don't, we don't really need it, right? Um, and this is sort of the flip side of me saying, okay, well, if you have laziness, you kind of want monads. Well, if you explicitly don't have laziness um, and you're operating in like an environment where you want to be very, very careful with how much memory and runtime you use, well, um, having these type classes is probably not all that valuable because the features that having them um, enables uh, are kind of I don't want to say too expensive for that kind of language, but definitely they're more interesting if you're if you're running on a system like Pascal where you have garbage collection and you have a, a very different evaluation for the Yeah, the Rust folks even complain about too deeply nested inference. Uh, so they don't even like inference too much. Uh, Rust code tends to be peppered with a lot more type annotations, some of which is enforced by the compiler. Actually, probably most of it is enforced by the compiler because it has boundaries for type inference that are deemed more pragmatic to the low-level programmer. So it has a different design philosophy. Yes. Philosophical question. How much FP is enough? Oh, how much FP is enough? Um, I mean, as, as a point in case, you're saying that a lot of features have actually made the transition right into mainstream languages. You also mentioned gadgets and, and type families and all of that stuff. But the more you go into these areas, even among masters, the less people you find that actually understand the code base that uses all of these features, right? Or that the time to understand it becomes probably not linearly harder, but super linearly harder. Are we at the point where we have basically taken from that piece what's necessary and move on and have to reach here and probably? So my, my hot take is that I think dependent types are going to blow up at some point. Um, and this is based basically on if you write a lot of TypeScript that has to talk to JavaScript, you will not believe how complicated the types that you just want naturally to have get. It's like because it just turns out that building a system that can type whatever nonsense JavaScript programmers do 
has an incredibly expressive type system. Um, well, there's an easy way out, right? There's any. Yes. And there's a hard way out, spending yes. five days trying to figure out the type system. Yes. So, 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 so I think things like GABTs might never, because I mean GABTs are kind of a special use case, right? Because what are they? You could say they're kind of a sort of reified function call. And you can use that to build some very cool abstract interfaces uh, that make sure you always get the blah blah blah. But mm -hmm. <laughs> GADTs, I'm less um, bullish on, but I think dependent types, if they ever make it to a point where you know people are ready to put them into languages, we have need Haskell doesn't have dependent types yet, right? So it's probably too early to say they're around the corner. But, but I could imagine. Requested feature. Hmm? It is the most requested feature. Yes. The most Wished for thing. But I, I could imagine that like if dependent types um, ever get to that stage that they would see pretty rapid uptake. Because if you already have like a type system or even just TypeScript's complexity, it's often very, very cool if you just have dependent, I think. Uh, but for the rest, yeah, I agree, right? It's also um, the the talk by by Michael Neumann always talking about he kind of makes the same point that probably um, the stuff that's made it into Java, that, that was like 90% of the stuff that made Haskell just cool, right? Um, mm -hmm. And now sort of the choice between whether you're using Java or Haskell depends more on um, maybe your familiarity or maybe you know maybe you just don't want to run on the JVM because the Haskell RTS is just more lightweight or it's still easier to do like concurrent stuff in Haskell, right? Because it has a different training model, but it's definitely no longer well. One of them is um, if you want to have something, you know, the only way you can traverse a data structure is by implementing a visitor class, uh, those days are gone, right? I think it's the other way around. I think the reality of the, so of the software engineering field is the complete opposite of how uh, procedural programmers see it. Procedural programmers see it as kind of an iterative improvement from assembly. Because C is essentially one to one with assembly. C is almost one to one with assembly and scary bits that we don't want to use. And uh, now Rust. I think Rust's entry into the mainstream proves that the world desperately wants more functional programming and continues to do so because the problems we're tackling are bigger. There's more and more software in your, there's probably more software in your toaster that was, than was in the Apollo missions going to the moon. Uh, stuff like this. Um, so, uh, I think Rust's popularity uh, shows that people still value familiarity over uh, over just switching paradigms entirely. But at the same time, the things that people miss in Rust are exactly the things that still haven't uh, carried over. People want to write Haskell, but they don't want to learn Haskell, you know, in a sense. So how much FT is enough? We we even even Haskell doesn't know how to tackle the biggest problem in computer science yet. Actually, not computer science, pardon, software engineering. That's a harder problem. And I mean, Rust solves a very, a, a niche that hasn't been solved before, right? Memory efficient code, which is safe. Right? Uh, Haskell solves that problem too. Have a look at Haskell Copilot. It is a library that NASA uses to fly their drones. It, it uh, compiles Haskell to space and time constant C. Uh, subset of Haskell. Um, you can program FPJs with Haskell. There's a compiler that compiles a subset of uh, an EDSL in Haskell to a uh, bit stream that you can bake into an FPGA or build hardware out of. Because what is hardware if not a functional, like a, a sequence of functional blocks? Um, I think we are, as a society, realizing that you know functional programming scales better, and as our aspirations scale higher, we're slowly overcoming the inertia from the C bit. So I guess the, the real the way I see it from the other side of the aisle is not how much FP is enough, but rather how much of a headache must you endure before you take the aspirin of functional programming. <laughs> I think John Backus had a similar point back in the day, though he might he may yet be vindicated. He was right about all of it. I guess we're done for now. Uh, thank you. Thank you. So yeah, thank you all for coming. Um, we've reserved space in the alehouse.
Tom, that's just, uh, just I think on the stairs. Be, basically just down the stairs, yeah. So everybody who wants to stay and uh, drink a beer or have some ramen um, is welcome to come with and for everybody who has to leave. Um, have a nice evening. Thanks. Thanks.